Hey everyone, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started in about 10 minutes. Uh, so this is the 10 minute mark. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and start finding your seats, that would be awesome, thank you. Hey, y'all, this is the five-minute mark, so we're going to get started in five minutes. 
So if you want to find your seats, that would be awesome. Thank you. Get a little closer. Now don't be shy. Come hither. Thank you, thank you. So FYI, anyone on team Wi-Fi, WMFS, I'll go over it shortly, but um, free open knowledge. It'll be on a slide as well. Thank you. Here it is. I feel like it's been five minutes. Shall I begin? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. 
Uh, I know you have choices what to do with your evening and you chose to be here. We appreciate that very much, so thank you. And also, thank you for tolerating our uh, elevator situation. I had a premonition that was gonna happen and it did. Probably my fault. I owe you a beer, there's some beer back there. <laughs> okay, so I am Amy Elder, Director of Recruiting for Wicked Media Foundation as of about six months ago. And I wanted to go over a few logistics, just kind of housekeeping stuff, so everyone's comfortable and settled. But before I do, I'd like to thank Maria O'Neill for planning this, concepting, execution, extraordinaire. Thank you very much. Spearheading it with the support of Sarah Rudland, Megan Neisler, um, for their guidance and support. Aaron Halfaker and Moriel Schottlander are our speakers tonight. We thank them as well. Brendan Campbell in the back, DJ, AV, <laughs> for his AV expertise. And of course, our well-loved Lee Maylee and Janet in the facilities group. So thank you very much. All right, going backwards here. Okay, so here we are. We are at 149 New Montgomery Street on the fifth floor. It took you 25 minutes to walk up the stairs, but you got here. If you need the stairs again, which I don't anticipate, they are back there, spiral staircase to the right, and also to the left by the elevators. Oxygen mask, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Seats in the back, trash, recycle, all that stuff. Bathrooms are down the hallway to the right. And let's see. So here is the map. All right, the agenda is definitely off, but that's life. Changes happen and we roll with it. So we are rolling with it. It'll be good. This will give you an idea of the flow. Okay. Um, so you know, we are uh, photographing the event and it is streaming live on YouTube. Um, if you'd like to join in on that, fun. Um, the Wi-Fi password is free open knowledge, hashtag Wikimedia Tech Talks. Uh, feel free to, while you're at it, like us on Facebook as well. And if you have any questions, go to myself or anyone else in a red name tag or shirt. I edit Wikipedia. And um, thanks again for coming. Next up is Aaron Hatmaker. Thank you. All right. Let me just get plugged in here. All right, okay. Well, and so, so there was a little bit of a lie in the uh, uh, setup for this. I thought that I could show you detecting vandalism in Wikipedia in three easy steps. Uh, it turns out it's going to be four, uh, regretfully. And with no further ado, let's get started. Um, so I, I'm Aaron Halfacre. Um, I'm actually a Wikipedia editor. I started uh, working on building tools for Wikipedians. Gosh, it's been almost 10 years now. Uh, since I started doing that. Uh, Epoch Fail is my uh, uh, Wikipedian persona. Um, I'm also a senior research scientist for the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and so today I want to talk to you about this interface between Wikipedia and the internet. Um, this has worked out pretty well. Um, the internet basically spills uh, human attention into Wikipedia and that turns into encyclopedia articles. Um, you know, it's great that anybody can edit Wikipedia, but of course this brings up questions about quality. 
Um, we might remember from around, I don't know, like 2006, 2007, this was the big question about Wikipedia. How could there be any quality in an encyclopedia that anybody can edit? Uh, we don't really ask this that much anymore, at least I don't, um, because it seems that Wikipedia is high quality, and so now the question is, how did it become high quality? And that's actually something that I'm gonna talk to you about today, one of the core technologies that enabled Wikipedia to be high quality even though anybody can edit it. Um, so it's important to note that there are a lot of initiatives that Wikipedians do in Wikipedia. Wikipedians are the people who edit Wikipedia. It's a bit of jargon, I'm gonna give you a ton of that. I'll try my best to define it. Um, anyway, so I wanted to tell you about two projects that are really important to quality in Wikipedia. The Counter Vandalism Unit, which is a group of Wikipedians who make sure that no vandalism that gets added to Wikipedia sticks around for very long. And the Wikipedia 1.0 Initiative, which was all about rating the quality of articles in Wikipedia so that at one point maybe we could cut a version of Wikipedia, call it 1.0, and say here are all the articles that are great. It turns out that that didn't work out very well, but a whole bunch of these subgroups inside of Wikipedia that were interested in medicine or Denmark or PlayStations um, took over this art article quality rating system and used it to help them organize their, their own work. Um, so it's really important for me uh, in this talk that you get a sense for how much there is behind the scenes in Wikipedia. Um, I really like to use an iceberg to talk about this. The tip of the iceberg is adding new content. This is actually, it's the first thing that you think of when you think of anybody can edit Wikipedia, you might add some content to it. But it turns out the stuff hidden beneath the water, quality and maintenance of what's already in Wikipedia, is a huge amount of the work that people do. Um, and it turns out that Wikipedia is a fire hose of new content, so there's a lot of quality and maintenance that actually has to happen. Um, so here's just some numbers that I can throw at you. There's about 160,000 edits that are saved to English Wikipedia a day. Um, that's NWiki, by the way. That's code that those of us who do a lot of development for English Wikipedia call it NWiki, or English Wikipedia, because NWiki is the database name. So I might say that later. I just want you to know that's what that means. Um, so we get 50,000 new article creations per day, and we, we get a ton of new people on the site, about uh, 1,400 new editors per day. Um, so the trick with uh, a machine learning model, which is one of the things that I'm gonna talk to you about today, is to take this fire hose of 160,000 edits and split that into the edits that need review that might possibly be vandalism and the edits that are probably okay and are almost certainly not vandalism so that we can spend less time reviewing the edits so that we can hopefully you know, actually spend time contributing new content to the encyclopedia. Um, so, how do we build an AI that flags edits that likely need review? All right, time to hop over to my IPython notebook. Okay, it's a little bit bigger. There we go. All right, and so in this talk, I'm going to show you the actual code and the overall strategy for basic damage detection in Wikipedia. Damage is a word that I'd rather use instead of vandalism because there's all sorts of damage that people do on purpose or not on purpose. When you do damage on purpose, that's vandalism, but sometimes you make a mistake and we still need to review that as it's added to the wiki. Okay, so uh, actually, who here is familiar with IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks? Okay, so we got about half the audience. Uh, how many people have written any Python at all? All right, so we got most of the audience. So this is gonna be mostly familiar to you. If you haven't picked up Python, I would recommend it. I like working in Python. This guide will actually show you the commands that you can run to replicate all the work that I do around the systems that I'm building to detect vandalism in Wikipedia. But also a wonderful thing about Python is it's relatively easy to read if you're not familiar with the language. Uh, we can talk about any of the things that are kind of confusing uh, after the talk. I believe there's some question and answer afterwards. Okay, so the basic process is going to follow this. In step one, we're going to gather some examples of human judgment, humans judging whether an edit is problematic or not, damaging or not. Um, in this case, we're gonna take advantage of reverts. Reverts are what Wikipedians do when they find an edit that's problematic in the wiki. They revert that edit to a previous state of the article, removing the change that was causing a problem. In the second step, we're gonna split this data, this human judgment data, into a training and test set. Um, in the third step, we're going to train our machine learning model on the training part of that set. And then finally, in the fourth step, we're going to test the model. And so the fourth step is very important. 
we, we get a machine learning model in the third step, but we don't know it, if it actually works until the fourth, so thus four steps. Okay, and then uh, once we get to the end, we'll have some fun applying this model to some edits that are actually happening live in Wikipedia. Um, and uh, so, whoops, of course this down arrow is not doing what I would hope it would do. Um, so this is a general overview of the process. We're gonna get our label observation, we're gonna make the split in the training and test set, we're gonna train our machine learning model to get a prediction model, and then finally we'll run our test set through that prediction model to get our statistics that tell us whether the, the model actually works. We'll actually be taking chunks of this diagram for each part as I move forward. Okay, so regretfully I can't run an SQL query directly against MediaWiki's production databases right from my Jupyter notebook, although it's actually quite close to being able to do that. There's a system that we're standing up right now where you can just log on to a website that we have and run queries against our database servers and run your own Jupyter notebooks. That's called PyWikiBob as a service. Regretfully, it's not online quite yet, but if you're really interested in playing around with Wikipedia data, I'd like to talk to you about that and then I can let you know when that's online. So, in the meantime, I'm gonna use a separate service called Quarry, which does let us query the production databases directly, and I'm going to run this query. This query connects to English Wikipedia, that's the NWiki right there, um, and we're going to select a random sample of revision IDs, which represent an edit in Wikipedia, that happened between uh, February 2015 and February 2016. We'll randomize them and limit it to about 20,000, which is about enough data to train and test our classifier. Um, so if you actually want to look at this query, which I kind of recommend, so we're going to pull up this page. This is actually our query interface. This is totally public. If you have an account on Wikipedia, you can just show up here and run your queries against our data. It's great. Um, you can see that it, it, it runs this query, the same query that I just showed in the, the IPython notebook, and here is uh, an example of some of the revision IDs that are returned by it. Um, I can click on this download data link and go to TSV, and that will actually download my data for me. So if I hop back to my IPython notebook, um, this link right here, this link is the one that I actually get from that uh, TSV uh, download. So, now I'm gonna use a little bit of IPython notebook foo to actually get this data from that URL and throw it into this RevIDs file, extract it with a little bit of uh, uh, Python list comprehension, and now we have our revision IDs of 20,000. Excellent, okay. So now that we have a set of revisions that we wanna work with, these revisions, again, represent uh, uh, edits in Wikipedia. Um, we want to label them as whether they were reverted or not, whether somebody saw fit to remove them from an article. Um, in this case, uh, um, or sorry, so we want to exclude a couple types of reverts, the kind of reverts that are probably not related to damage or vandalism. In this case, it's going to be, uh, sometimes you'll revert yourself, you'll make a change, and then you'll see that that change actually wasn't good, and you'll throw it away. Uh, other times, somebody will revert you, but then somebody else will show up and revert back to your edit and say, actually, no, this did belong in the article. And so both of those we want to exclude from the set because they're, they're probably actually good edits in the end. So this chunk of code here, which is a little bit complex, is going to get that for us. We're going to use two libraries that I've written for um, extracting data from uh, the MediaWiki API that's behind Wikipedia, this MWAPI and MWReverts. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through this really quickly because we don't have a ton of time, but if you want to dig into this later, this IPython notebook is online and we can definitely talk about it afterwards. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a session for talking to the API. You can actually see the URL here. This connects to the English Wikipedia. If you throw this into your browser, it'll show you the English Wikipedia main page. Um, we're also going to send a user agent along with this so that if I do something bad, the operations people at the Wikimedia Foundation can say, hey, a half acre at wikimedia.org. Stop hitting the API so hard you're causing problems. So anyway, that's all that's up, that is about. Okay, so now we're gonna go through a loop with the revision IDs that we have and actually check to see if they were reverted. These few lines here actually run this call using this MW reverts library and the session that we just set up in order to check to see what the reverted status of this edit is. So if the edit was reverted, then we're gonna check to see was it reverted by the same user who saved the edit in the first place. Um, we're also gonna check to see if it was reverted back to by somebody who's not the same user who saved it in the first place. Um, and if it was reverted and neither of these two things are true, then we're gonna mark it as probably a damaging revert, likely to be vandalism. And otherwise, we're gonna mark it as false. Okay, so these are our true and false labels to our set of 20,000 edits in Wikipedia. 
And so if we actually try and run this, then we'll, because I have a little bit of logging at the bottom, we'll get some dots and we'll see an R for the, the edit that was actually reverted. This actually takes too long to run across 20,000 revisions. So I've uploaded a data set that will just load into place. Um, so these next few lines of code are going to get us our pairs of revision ID and whether the revision was reverted or not, true or false. So it turns out that after running this, we only actually get 19,868 revisions back. This is because uh, between the time that I ran the query to get the edits and when I ran the query to check to see if the edits were reverted, some of the pages that were associated with those edits were deleted. And so we can't actually check to see if they were reverted. A lot of pages are created in Wikipedia that are deleted pretty quickly. Um, it turns out that if you create a page about your favorite garage band, it might not survive. Um, and so, but anyway, this 132 edits is probably an acceptable loss, so we'll move on. But one thing before we do, I just want to spot check to make sure that the edits that we marked as reverted are actually probably damaging in Wikipedia. Again, we don't have a ton of time to go through this, so I just want to give you a quick overview of what I found when I looked at this. So this is a bunch of links that will actually take us to diffs in Wikipedia. Oh, why don't we actually load up the first one? That'll be kind of nice. Maybe. All right. So in this example of a reverted edit, we can see a massive amount of removal of content from the article. So on the left-hand side, we're seeing the previous version of the article, and now we're seeing the current version of the article on the right-hand side, and we can see that a ton of content was totally removed. Huge sections of stuff in the article about uh, Chris Jericho, who is apparently a person. Um, oops. Get my keyboard shortcuts down so I don't have to keep going out at full screen. But anyway, so I looked through each of these edits. Again, these are edits that were actually marked as reverted, and I generally saw damage here. So a section blanking, unexplained addition of nonsense, vandalism with the comment, I don't know, uh, adds non existing category, test edit that removes some punctuation, adds a spam link to the article, adds nonsense special characters to the article, unconstructive link changes, vandalism around a uh, pay pay may may. Um, and uh, of course some other nonsense that were added to the article. So it looks like when we label things as reverted with this strategy, we're generally catching damage, so it looks like we're pretty good. All right, part two. I did, I, I added these comments based on what I saw in these edits. We could go through them one by one, but that might take the rest of the 15 minutes that I have. So, all right, on to part two. So now we're going to uh, take this data set that we have, these revision IDs and whether they were reverted or not, and we're gonna split them into a training and testing set. This is really important because when we train a machine learning model, we don't wanna train it on the same data that we tested on afterwards because the machine learning model could do something very stupid and learn something not uh, actually to do with vandalism in Wikipedia, but just has something to do with the training set that we actually gave to it. So it's really important that when we test it afterwards, we give it observations of edits that it's never seen before. So we actually test its ability to see new data. So the first thing that we're gonna do here is split this uh, data set of about 20,000 edits into a training and testing set. Um, because this is generally going to work okay, I'm going to split this data set into uh, 15,000 edits for our training set and about 5,000 edits for our testing set. So it's about 80-20 split. Uh, this is relatively common in machine learning. All right, so the next thing that we need to do is actually extract the features for these edits. And so features are what a machine learning model uses as signal to make its predictions. Features are uh, numerical statistics about what happened in the edit that might tell us something about whether this edit was damaging or not. And it'll make a lot of sense when I actually go through some of the examples. So for example, the first feature that we're gonna look for is the longest repeated character added. So it's actually quite common in Wikipedia to add vandalism that's just KKKKKKKKKK. I'm not quite sure why, but anyway, so we can catch these repeated characters over and over again and flag that as potentially vandalism. The longer the repeated character, the more likely to be vandalism. Um, we also do some basic diff features, so the number of words that were added in the edit, the number of words that were removed. Um, we're gonna do some information theoretic measures. These uh, prop delta sums are generally just measuring how many bad words, how many informal words like hello, ha ha, we, fun, these sort of things were added to the article. And nonstop words are, are really actually just a bit of jargon for words that actually mean something. Um, and so we're gonna use these information theoretic measures to look for the addition of curse words, informal words, or words that mean something that didn't exist in the article beforehand. All right, 
three more features. We're going to look at whether the user who saved the edit was anonymous. We're going to look at whether the user was in a group that was generally trusted in Wikipedia. So our system administrators who are the uh, sysops, those are the people who generally have advanced rights in Wikipedia. They actually go through a substantial vetting process. And bots, which are uh, non-human editors that have also gone through a substantial editing or a substantial vetting process. Finally, we'll look at the time since the user registered their account because newcomers are usually the people who do vandalism in Wikipedia. Okay, so those are our features, and you can kind of see how the, all of those will turn into a numerical value. But I don't want you to trust me. I actually want to extract some of these features and show you what they look like. And so this next chunk of code is going to demonstrate how we can use this rev scoring system. By the way, I forgot to mention this. Almost this entire IPython notebook is going to pull from this rev scoring library that I built in Python specifically to make this work of building machine learning models for Wikipedia easier. So anyway, that's what I mean when I say rev scoring. Okay, so we're going to uh, import a ex uh, feature extractor from rev scoring. We're going to give it the same session that we actually used earlier to detect whether edits were reverted. This is an API session for accessing Wikipedia's backend API, um, which, by the way, is open to everybody, so you can run this IPython notebook and it'll work for you too. Um, and we'll check a couple of the edits that we saw in the reverted case to see what kind of features actually get extracted. And so you can see we're calling the API extractor. We're ask asking it to extract features for a particular revision. This features uh, value is actually this list that we defined just up here. Okay, and so for these two edits, we can see how this turns into a, a list of numerical statistics. Of course, some of these are Boolean. Booleans, of course, are numerical as zero and one, and so we can still use those as predictors just like any numerical value. Um, so uh, any questions about how we got to features here? Yeah, so the question is, um, if, we, if we make all of this stuff public, does that make it easier for people to uh, program something that might help them vandalize Wikipedia? So this is a question that I get a lot. Um, the really cool thing, or at least the, the maybe cool thing that we have with vandalism in Wikipedia, is that vandals generally aren't very clever. They want to put the same sort of nonsense over and over again in Wikipedia, and so that makes them easier to catch. If there's somebody who's actually reading through my IPython notebook, figuring out how the machine learning models work, and then using that to vandalize Wikipedia, I don't really actually have much hope for catching them. Um, and so I'm kind of betting that vandals really aren't going to even know that this exists or go through that trouble to do it. We have other mechanisms in Wikipedia for catching more nuanced vandalism. I'm really just trying to target the, the people who are not very clear. Okay, so on to actually extracting features for this whole training set. Again, this is something that's going to take some time. It actually has to gather data from a few different parts of Wikipedia for each edit that it has to look at. And so I limited this one to actually just looking at the first 20, and I uploaded a data set that actually contains the entire uh, extracted feature set for the training set. This block of code just pulls in that already extracted data from this, this training set. Um, and so again, we've, we've uh, missed a few edits here. Um, so we've dropped our original 15,000 uh, training set edits down to 14,979. And this is because sometimes uh, we don't just uh, delete the page that an edit appeared in, but we also will delete individual edits within a page. You know, sometimes we'll actually, somebody will actually put inside of an edit something that's so egregiously damaging that we can't even have it in the history of Wikipedia, such as, I learned your mailing address and I wanted to cause harm to you. I might put that in an edit on Wikipedia. Those are the edits that we delete. And this is about the rate that it happens. So we lost about 21 edits here out of 15,000, probably because they were actually deleted out of the article that they originally appeared in. So but we're pretty close to the 15,000 number, so I think we're good to go. On to part three, actually using this data to train the machine learning model. So uh, now that we have a set of features extracted for our training set, we can give this to our machine learning model and end up with a prediction model that we can actually use to make predictions about new data. Um, so the rev scoring library provides a lot of algorithms that we can use for training a machine learning model. Um, but from past experience, I know that our gradient boosting classifier works quite well in predicting reverted edits. Um, so we'll just use that. And so the next few lines of code are really just showing how to construct a gradient boosting model with some of the parameters that I've learned actually work quite well 
for this particular context in this particular model. We use the hyperparameter tuning strategy for this, which is a really fancy name for try a lot of parameters and see which one works out best. If you want to see how that actually works out, we can get into that in the question and answer period. Um, but really, the most important line is right here. Um, so we construct our model called is reverted. So this is going to predict whether an edit is likely to be reverted. Um, and then we give it our training features reverted set. So this is our features plus whether the edit was reverted or not. And this model is going to build correlation just between those features and the thing that we want it to predict. Um, turns out that this takes about 16 seconds, uh, which is what my output reads. And now we have a trained model that we can play around with. So let's try uh, running it against a few edits from our test set. So in this block of code, I'm going to grab a few edits that were reverted, a few edits that were not reverted, and we'll actually extract feature values and then run our prediction model against those feature values to find out uh, what our prediction model says. So I'll just run this chunk of code real quick. And we can see it churning through each of the edits, trying to figure out, first we're going to go through the edits that actually were reverted. Um, and so we can see the prediction that's actually coming out, it keeps predicting true, so it's actually catching these edits and figuring out, yes, in fact, these should be reverted. Um, the number on the far right is the confidence that we have for them. And so as we get to the false values, the ones that start with false, we're getting into the set of edits that actually weren't reverted. And you can see that our prediction model is also predicting that these edits are probably not going to be reverted with relatively high confidence. I, I actually didn't give the false prediction here. This is the true prediction again, so lower is better. Um, let's see. Oh, and we have a false positive down there. So let's take a look at this false positive and see what the heck is going on there. Oh, there we go. All right. So we can see in this uh, article about Craig Phillips, uh, who is, I think he's a TV personality. Yeah, there we go. Phillips has presented as resident experts on a large number of TV shows. Um, and it looks like this editor removed uh, Sex in the City Series 4, Episode 7 from the set of episodes that Phillips has appeared on, uh, with the, the comment, Craig was never on SATC, which I'm guessing is Sex in the City. Um, so I, I'm not sure if this edit is actually vandalism. Um, we'd, we'd probably have to do some research to find out if, if this was actually a damaging edit in Wikipedia. But it seems like this is probably worth review, so I don't, I don't feel too bad about it. It seems like this is something that somebody should probably see if it was actually causing damage to the article. So it seems like we're doing okay. Generally, we're predicting that the reverted edits should be reverted, and the non-reverted edits probably shouldn't be reverted. So looks good. All right, on to part four. So the, the analysis that we did above is great in that it gives us an intuitive sense for whether this model is doing anything useful at all. But it's not great in that it, it's hard to compare two models in this way. We just really just took a random sample of edits that we think it should predict one way and edits that we think it should predict another way and check to see if it generally was doing what we suspected. What we really want is a statistic, something that we can say this model does better than this other model by comparing two numbers. And so that's what we're going to do here. Um, so we're going to run our test set through the prediction model and use that to generate some statistics about how this prediction model is working. Um, so again, generating the feature set for this test set is going to take a long time, and so I pre-generated this in advance, and so we're just going to load that into memory here. These few lines do that for us. Um, we have these uh, 4,862 observations that we're going to test our model against, these observations that we, we know whether they were reverted or not, but the model doesn't know whether they were reverted or not. Remember, again, we withheld this test set so the model couldn't see it when we were actually training it. We're going to train on five test statistics, the accuracy, the precision, which is the proportion of uh, correct positive predictions, the, the proportion of times where we say this is vandalism and it is, um, the recall, which is the proportion of vandalism that we actually catch, the receiver operating characteristic, which is hard to describe but hard to game too, um, which is an information theoretic measure of the true positive rate and the false positive rate, and then finally this filter rate at 90% recall, which is a measure of how much of the uh, recent changes feed, the 160,000 edits per day, we can mark as not needing review and therefore save people patrolling Wikipedia the time of actually needing to review them. Um, so higher numbers are better in all of these cases. So in order to do that, again, we're going to draw from the revision scoring library um, and pull in some test statistics, accuracy, precision, maybe we can scroll to the right, yeah, recall, ROC and filter rate at recall. 
we'll pass those to the test function for our model along with our testing features reverted set um, and ask it what we get. And so we see that we get an accuracy of about 80%. So about 80% of the predictions are right. Um, we get a precision of uh, 20%, so about 20% of the time that it predicts that something will need to be reverted, it actually will. Um, we get a recall of about 82%, so that means that we very easily catch about 82% of the vandals in Wikipedia. Um, uh, ROC, AUC, I'm just going to tell you this is good. Um, it's not great, we can do better uh, in our production systems, but this isn't bad, this is useful. Um, and then finally, um, looking at our filter rate, we can filter about 63% of the edits in Wikipedia and say these actually don't need review, they're actually pretty good. Um, all right, so we have we have uh, built a uh, machine learning model. We've checked to see if it works in a qualitative way by looking, um, and a quantitative way by actually generating some some statistics. So now let's actually try and do something useful with it. So the bonus round, let's listen to Wikipedia's vandalism. You might have noticed on the screens when you came in, we had the listen to Wikipedia thing running, which makes a ping noise every time Wikipedia gets edited. I'm actually going to connect to the same feed of edits that that system does, uh, the called RC stream. If you want to read more about it, there's all sorts of links in the SciPython notebook. Um, this code is actually really just lifted from the documentation for RC stream for how to connect to it. But we're going to import the Socket.io client. We're going to define this namespace thing. We're going to tell it what to do when it sees a change come through. And uh, when it sees a change come through, it's going to check to see if it's an edit. It's going to get the revision ID, which represents the edit of Wikipedia. We're going to extract features for that edit. We're going to ask the prediction model to score it. If the prediction is bad, we're going to print please review. And if we're, the prediction is good, we're just going to print good edit and move forward. All right, we'll run this for 120 seconds and see what we get. All right, oh wow, right away we get a couple. Not very strong predictions, 62 and 64%. Uh, so let's see. Let's close some of these tabs and we can just look and see what we get. Okay, so. Here we see an anonymous editor who's making a change to name of a player, looks like on a sports team. And it doesn't look like the name has changed substantially. It might be an alternate transliteration. This seems like it's worth review. I, it's hard for me to tell that it's vandalism. Somebody who's more familiar that, with this might be able to, to help with that. But it seems like this, it was good that it flagged this. This is something that definitely needs review. Cool. Okay, let's look at Let's try and find one that's higher probability. Maybe we can find some egregious vandalism in Wikipedia while we're at it. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this looks awful. This is, this is definitely not good, so I'm just gonna hit undo here. I'm gonna say that uh, this is vandalism, which, which the Wikipedian code for is RVV, revert for vandalism. Save the page. And we've reverted some vandalism. All right, so it turns out that with this model, we can filter out about 64% of the edits that are coming into Wikipedia. So we can reduce the workload of somebody who's patrolling for vandalism by about 64%. It turns out that in our production system where I use a lot more features and we do a lot more tuning work, we can get that up to 75%. So reduce the patrolling workload down to 75% in Wikipedia. And now it comes time for the pitch. We're a volunteer organization. I'm not a volunteer, I'm actually paid, but I need your help anyway. Y'all are technologists, and we have a lot of technological work that needs that we need to support the system to make it easier for a real volunteers, the people who write Wikipedia, to have their work be easier. So we want your support. We need people to help us label edits in Wikipedia. If you're a Wikipedia editor, we could really use your help there. Um, we need people who, who speak more than English because I'm only an English speaker and we're expanding this to as many wikis as we can. We're right now up to 16 different languages. It would be great if we were at 100. Um, we need people to help us write code. We, this, is, um, this is big data. We need to be horizontally scalable. Right now, we can uh, review and edit in about half a second. It would be great if we could get that down to a quarter second. Um, and of course, modeling, the things that I was just showing you, features, optimization, and evaluation. Um, we're completely online, we're completely open working group. In fact, most of the people who program this system with me, the system that actually catches vandalism in Wikipedia, are volunteers. Um, we, we have an open uh, GitHub group on Wikipedia that we call WikiAI, where we're building a lot of technologies around detecting vandalism in Wikipedia and predicting the quality of edits in Wikipedia. Um, and so you're very welcome to get involved. 
please let me know afterwards if you're interested in checking it out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Looks like we have some raffle winners. All right. Okay. Pull out your raffle tickets. I believe Maria has the goods. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So we've got 812015. 812017, 812020208120058120022. Lots of lucky winners. Hopefully, those of you who walked up the stairs. Very good. Let's see where we're at. Okay, looks like we have a little bit of a tiny break. If anyone needs to. Get up, get a slice of pizza. Otherwise, um, shall, hi, Terry. <laughs> shall we? Oh, yes.
I would just start talking. Hello. Oh my, that was way louder than I expected. We're going to start back in like a minute. All right, so hello. My name is Moriel. I work for the collaboration team uh, here at the Wikimedia Foundation, and I'll talk to you about OJS UI, which is our UI library. And it's object-oriented JavaScript user interface library, which is why we you know, abbreviate it. So how did things really start and why do we need you know, a library like that? So basically, it all started from Visual Editor. So if you don't know Visual Editor, this is more or less the way it looks like today. This is the way for you to edit Wikipedia articles without knowing Wikitext and just edit you know, what you see is what you get. So this project, Visual Editor, started in 2011. And very quickly, it was you know, very clear that we need to do something about the UI. Like, this is a system that is starting to get really big. It's JavaScript. Um, we need a lot of you know, buttons and dialogues and widgets and things that you know, we didn't really have so, much, so many of in any of our other you know, interfaces. So we started developing a lot of that inside Visual Editor. And then towards 2013, or actually at the, in the late uh, summer of 2013, um, there was a decision to split the product into three different repositories. So two of them were Visual Editor product itself. One of them is the core product that can work on any piece of software on any blank you know, HTML page. Um, on top of it came Visual Editor MediaWiki, which has a layer that is specific for MediaWiki stuff. And then out of both of those, we took away the 
library that we use to create all those widgets and buttons and everything, and we call it OJS UI, and we split it out as its own library so that we can actually use it in other places uh, in our code. So why do we need to build anything new? Why aren't we, you know, using something existing? There's jQuery UI in 2011. Why didn't we use that? Um, well, you know, we're engineers. So I guess the first answer is, why not? You know, but more seriously. So MediaWiki is very different than many other, um, you know, programs out there and many other um, platforms. MediaWiki is super, super extensible. What do I mean about that? Well, we allow for extensions, what you know, many other products call plugins. Okay, that's fairly usual. But we also allow for user scripts. So if you go to Wikipedia and you sign up, you can go to one of those two pages in your namespace, so common.js and common.css. Those are actually you know, pages under your name. And if you go to common.js and you write JavaScript, that would actually affect most of the pages that you see from your user page. So you can actually add the scripts you know, that change stuff in Wikipedia to your user space. We also have gadgets, which are very similar, except these you can actually share between you. So a lot of people, um, you know, if they have a really cool thing that they created for their own user space and people start getting interested in that, release it as a gadget. And other people can add it you know, to their user uh, space and have some script that does something on Wikipedia. And it can be something like, you know, um, show me or, or you know, mark certain words in an article or give me links to definitions in Wiktionary. Whatever it is, if it's done in JavaScript, you can do it in gadgets and in scripts. And we have 280 languages of support about that, which makes it 895 wikis that we support. That's a lot. So, these things really create a lot of challenge when we try to figure out what we, you know, what kind of libraries, what we actually need to use when we have, you know, our front end stuff. So, what are the constraints? Well, first of all, we can't really trust the DOM for the data storage. We we don't know what happened to the DOM between, you know, the, us reading it um, and us analyzing it for whatever data it is. Some of it is because we have user scripts, and some users can have something that manipulates this DOM and does something different. We don't know. So we don't really want to trust the DOM. On top of that, we don't think it's a good idea to trust the DOM for data, but that's a different issue. We have to make sure that everything is cross-platform and cross-browser. Wikipedia has to work, has to work, in as many places in the world as possible, right? So even if you have a really weird phone from 10 years ago, you will turn on Wikipedia. At the very least, you'll be able to read it. So then on top of that, we would like you to also be able to do a lot of other things. And there, we kind of like need to figure out, okay, where is the limit between what we can do with the technology that we support and what we can do with you know, the devices that are out there. But at the very, very least, we want to make sure that people can actually read the um, Wikipedia. So it has to be cross-platform, it has to be cross-browser, it has to work everywhere. It must be themable. And we need to have one place for UIs and widgets uh, components so that users that create gadgets and create, you know, plugins and create extensions can have one consistent UI elements uh, or a bank of elements to use. So these are kind of like the constraints that we have. And then we looked at a lot of things like jQuery UI, and we ran into a couple of issues. And jQuery UI, isn't, it's not that it's bad. It's very good. It doesn't answer the things that we run into. Um, all right. So what are the existing problems with things out there? Well, first of all, for the most part, Data is stored in the DOM. So if you have, so this is an example from Bootstrap, for example. Um, you have, you know, like a div and it grabs some link. And then you have things like data toggle and data something and data something else. And a lot of times the JavaScript will then reach into that DOM element and check its status by whatever data attributes it has and change those uh, data attributes and keep on, you know, 
uh, preserving the state in the DOM. And those are the kind of things that we really don't want to use. So that is the first problem. The second problem is that DOM events in general can be really messy. So here's an example. We have an input field. Let's say I want to do something once the you know, text changes. So I need to listen to an event that tells me you know, the data has changed. OK. There are about five events that I need to listen to. Key down um, is not bad, but it doesn't answer all cases, as I will point out. But on top of the fact that it doesn't answer all cases, I also need to make sure when, it, when I intercept it that we're not talking about arrows or enter, because those do not change the content, right? Um, change event uh, is great, except it requires a focus change. So I need to get out of that input field, or at least for the most part. So, you know, if I want while I'm typing, that's a little bit of a problem. Input is fairly new. And cut and paste events I have to listen to, because what happens if I right click? So I select, and then I right click the mouse, and I cut. No keystroke happened ever, right? I did not change the focus, so it's not a change event. Um, I have to listen to that event, and same thing with paste. So I have five events, at least, to listen to. But the plot thickens, because some of those events are emitted before the content actually changed, right? Uh, so the events are really messy. So what, what we actually said is, okay, we're going to take these events, um, and we're going to wrap all of that behavior in a widget. And we call it text input widget in this kind of case. And really what the widget does is it intercepts all those events. And then it says, OK, I'm waiting for the stack to clear. So that way, I'm actually going to see what the actual situation is with that input. right? Even if I got the event before the text changed, I'm going to wait for the stack to clear. And then checks if the content changed. If it didn't, it ignores it. And then if it didn't, it emits change. So then your code can just listen to that widget, ignores what happens in the actual DOM. If you know this event, that event, the widget just abstracts it out. So that is something that we really wanted to make sure that we can do so that nobody will have to, you know, has to deal with all these events. And then events are added, removed. Some browsers, because the plot even thickens even more, because some browsers treat that event better than the other event. Can get really messy. We wanted to keep that messy part away from you know the users that want to you know, use these things in um, in the interface. So we wanted to abstract it out. So what do we want out of a library? We wanted object oriented. We wanted event emitter support. So I know I got like this reaction of uh, jQuery has event emission something uh, very very basic I think right. We wanted something really event emitter proper event emitter support. We wanted to make sure that it's componentized. Um, basically, we wanted to build bigger widgets based on smaller widgets so that everybody can build uh, better um, components. We want to abstract the DOM. You just saw why. So we don't want to mess with all the like, you know, stuff behind the hood. And we wanted to make sure that we have a library of mix-ins that everybody can use if you're creating you know, a new uh, component. And the one thing that we, you know, that I mentioned in the beginning, we wanted the separation of data and UI. We wanted to make sure that our data is not in the UI component. It's outside of it. And the last thing is we wanted to make sure that we have no JavaScript support for those cases where we have, you know, uh, devices that don't support JavaScript. They still are supposed to read stuff. They're still supposed to interact with stuff. They might not interact with the, you know, the JavaScript full experience, but they have to have the same kind of uh, experience. So everything is OUI. The top ones are OUI JavaScript, and the absolute last one, the no JavaScript support, is obviously not JavaScript. Um, it's PHP. So we have a layer of PHP that we also created on top of that, or actually on below that. So what does it look like? OJS UI and OJS. So it's actually kind of like a split two library system. OJS is the one, is the basic one, is the one in charge of object oriented stuff like inheritance, mix ins, event emitter, and all the utilities that we need to do. And then on top of that, we have OJS UI as the widgets, as um, the abstraction of the DOM, as the themes, all of that. And then we also have OUI PHP. 
And that is basically widgets and the DOM structure for the widgets that fit both the themes and the behavior layer of the JavaScript. So what that lets us do is start with OUI PHP. If the user doesn't have support for JavaScript, it stops there and just shows the user, you know, whatever the inputs or whatever we need to show them. And if the user does have uh, JavaScript support, we have something called infuse, where then the JavaScript takes whatever already exists and infuse it in, um, basically uses it as if the JavaScript created those, um, you know, components. So I'll show you an example. This is a screenshot from uh, Echo. It's our notification system. And it's just you know a pop-up with some notifications. If you read here, you see I've been experimenting a little bit. So my other user you know, notifies another user of mine that there's a notification. That's great. So what, what's nice with that is that this pop-up, if we only look at this list, so this list is an existing you know, OUI widget called the select widget, because I have items in it, and you, know, you can select stuff, so all right. So I have a basic behavior of some list of stuff, some items right, that I can select. This single item, so that humongous name, it's basically, it's just in the namespace of the echo um, uh, extension, but basically it is extending the option widget of OUI, and the option widget basically is um, uh, in charge of all the events of which item is being chosen um, inside the select widget. So I have select with options, but it doesn't just extends option widget, it also has inside it label widget and icon widget and button widget. So it's really easy to kind of like construct um, something that looks relatively very advanced with you know just existing components already. So uh, and that's what we basically said before, building you know bigger stuff based on smaller widgets, which is great. But the you know the entire widget, we said that the data should be separated, and that's exactly what we're doing. So we actually have this DM, which is the data model uh, object, and it keeps its own state and all the logic that has to do with its state. So it is the data object, and the widget accepts it and listens to events. Okay, so the data is completely, completely separate from the DOM or from the UI. We can theoretically and practically just switch the UI element and you know, all the logic, everything else exists you know, somewhere else. And in the code, so this is of course just a snippet, it doesn't look like that uh, completely, although more or less. So basically the widget accepts a model that model and then stores the model and listens to it. So you can see this model, is there like a, aha, this model, okay, connect, and we're connecting to the events and then we'll react to the events. And we're creating a button widget here and everything is event-based. So we're creating a button, button widget and we're attaching it and then we're saying, okay, listen to click event. Okay, when we click that, mark things as red. And this, right, is our internal method here that changes the model. So everything, this is basically a view model that you probably all know, but everything is done with, you know, the separate model and events, which is, um, you know, part of the uh, principles that we wanted to keep. So we have tons and tons of widgets, tons and tons of widgets, really. Um, I actually created this lecture yesterday um, um, adding, you know, more screenshots because I was actually surprised about, you know, five more widgets that were added in, which is cool. So these are just, you know, very general kind of examples of stuff we have from simple stuff like buttons to fairly advanced stuff like draggable stuff, um, search widget, this entire thing, this entire thing is one big widget. So you can basically just use that um, and just replace the logic and you're done. It's really cool stuff, um, at least that's what we think, and we would love to you know, share it with everybody. So it's MIT license, you're all welcome to use it, contribute to it, uh, give us feedback, of course. Uh, I'm very disappointed about the colors um, here. Uh, apparently it's not very visible, sorry about that, but I will share that PDF. Uh, there's no way we can increase the, is there? Maybe? Okay. Well, I will share this PDF. It's Oh, select the text. Um, where it, anyone has access? Where's the computer? Behind me. Okay. Let's see if I can. Oh, 
The mouse is moving. Oh, you're doing it. Okay. That's not better. <laughs> if only. Hi. Well, um, I will definitely share this. I'm very disappointed. I'm so sorry. All right. I'll definitely share this. Um, we have the official documentation. We have the code documentation. We would love to see the demos are up. Um, and we would love to see you join us in the repository. Pull requests are welcome, or in our case, um, patches for Garrett. Thank you. What is next? Sorry. So now we're going to transition into a Q&A section for Aaron and Moriel, if anyone has any questions. Um, we just asked that uh, we use the question mic over there for, uh, for, for the sake of folks on the remote stream. And thank you. Uh, so this is a question about OOJS UI, um, and that is, for applications which uh, don't need to support these old browsers, do you need to use PHP, or can you just use the JavaScript engine? So applications that are either strictly JavaScript, like Visual Editor, for example. Visual Editor um, is only JavaScript. There's no, no real meaning for it you know, outside. Uh, we don't use uh, you know, the PHP part. Um, for Features that you don't need, you know, that are extra dialogue stuff that will not appear for a user that doesn't, you know, use the JavaScript. We don't use the PHP side. The PHP side is there to help us with, you know, the original version um, not du being duplicated again by another code now for JavaScript, right? So setting up the stage and then everything else that's above that will not be. Thank you. Where can we go to find out and contribute to OJS? So if um, this was legible, it would show you. Um, unfortunately, um, the only thing I can try and do is either copy this. Can you copy this to like a blank page? I did not anticipate that all of them will look like they're visited because I visited them. I'll, I'll try to put them up on a, on a blank page, and I'll definitely send this um, to all the participants and share this. My question is about the machine learning presentation. Do you do anything about uh, edits by bots? Uh, yeah, so um, we, we generally don't like uh, worry about edits by bots as uh, needing controller review. Um, but we, we still include edits by bots in the predictions that we make. We actually set up our service so that you can run any edit, whether it's a bot or a human or whatever, through the service. Um, but one of the things that we actually struggle with quite a bit is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of our wikis, we run, you know, uh, gosh, is it 180 languages of Wikipedia and 180 languages of a bunch of other projects. Um, and so many of those, those wikis are primarily edited by bots. And by and large, any bot edit is very unlikely to be vandalism. At least it's not intentional damage. It's maybe accidental damage at a large scale. Um, and so uh, when we have uh, people reviewing edits by bots, it's, it, it's just overwhelming. And it's pretty much all good. And so usually we, we ignore those in practice, but the system that we build could potentially actually be used to detect damage caused by bots. Um, I have not seen that actually happen in practice. Um, I've not seen people actually find that useful, um, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done. So are the bots doing the edits just anyone, or are they by uh, contributors, legit contributors? So uh, most of our uh, like large wikis, like you know English, German, Japanese, Italian, Spanish, French, uh, 
you know, Chinese, um, like the, the big wikis, they have robust processes around vetting uh, people who are given a bot flag, a, a flag that marks their account as a bot, and, and they have policies against anybody else running an automated tool that actually edits for them. Um, and it's uh, relatively consistently enforced. And so, so most of the time when you, when you see somebody who is running an official bot, then they've gone through a substantial vetting process before they get to that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a question about um, at the NPM packages. My my understanding, I'm I don't know much about NPM, but it's a it's a server server side JavaScript uh, framework. Is that is that right? So you can use it in Node, but NPM is also might help you with things like uh, Grunt or. With, with what? With like auto automated, I don't know how to define it. Aut automated JavaScript tools. Oh, I see. Um, like Grunt, so for you example. Can, so you can inst like you know include it in your. I see. Um, for unit tests and stuff. Yeah, but oh, it's also uh, Node.js is an NPM, so you can also use it there. Um, especially since I include both OJS and OJS UI, because you mm -hmm. can also use OJS separately and just get you know. Mix ins, extends, you know, all the utilities and stuff like that without all the UI stuff. I see, yeah. Have you tried uh, running your server code with uh, Node.js on the server side, or is PHP better for that, or it doesn't matter that all that much for what you're doing? Well, MediaWiki is PHP, so we're, we're not going to, you know, switch now to Node.js. We do have um, Parsoid that works on Node.js, but then um, we don't. Like it, it doesn't do the UI part. So for the moment, as far as I know, we don't really have things that you know really need the UI part in Node.js. Everything it works on PHP and MediaWiki, and we're not we can't really replace that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why OJS PHP was born. See, thanks. Hi, uh, my question is for Aaron. Uh, and forgive me, uh, I'm, I don't write in Python, but I, from, I'm just trying to wrap my head around some of the logic. Um, when you're in that forward loop there, when you guys were looking over all those revisions, um, what stood out to me from what I think I understand is that you're, the string value of some of those edits and those revisions, are you um, equally in that whole algorithm, like whatever you're preparing, is, it's almost a, the frequency of the edit you're evaluating that the frequency and the user and then the string value. Like that's, it almost seems those are more important than the value itself. Is that fair to say? Um, if I'm answering, if you understand my question. I, so I, I think I'm understanding it as, as like the, the history of the user is important when you're trying to figure out if an edit is vandalism. Yeah, that's, that's even more important than the content or the string value itself. Is that true? Or um, so so uh, there's there's actually a really substantial history of vandalism detection literature uh, for Wikipedia, and so the vast majority of the predictive signal we can get from the basic features that I showed you, this is really like the the most basic feature set that I could possibly show you. Um, right now in production, we don't use uh, historical features about a user for predicting whether their next edit is going to be vandalism, but the research literature suggests that we can get a substantial amount of additional signal from this. The thing that I'm really concerned about is um, uh, having somebody get into a feedback cycle where, like, let's say your first edit on Wikipedia was a mistake, so it got reverted, and now we're super skeptical of your next edit, and so maybe we're more likely to revert that one, and now by the third edit, we hate you and we want you to leave. Um, so, so instead, what I've been looking at is not looking at how people reacted to your edit, but instead applying the per edit vandalism detection historically. And so in, rather than asking, are you the kind of editor who gets reverted, to ask, are you the kind of editor that does edits that look like vandalism? Um, and so uh, I've, I've done some work, I actually have a little bit of published work in that area that suggests that this, this works, but I haven't tried it with, uh, to, I haven't tried it to see how much additional signal that you can get on the, you know, is this edit actually vandalism use case. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot in that direction. Okay, yeah, I just Thank wanted you. to ask, I think. Solid question. Cool, yeah, I understand the whole machine learning model. Thanks. Uh, going to the machine learning question, um, do you ever see a point where you automatically reject an edit? It's 90%, and if so, 
do you spit back an error message saying, you know, it's been not only rejected, but here's the, here's what you tripped up, right? Again, worries about the feedback cycle and that. Um, those seem to be the machine learning applications I think about the most is giving feedback to the user other than just being told the algorithm hates you. Yeah, so, so um, like the first question, have we, have we looked at automatically reverting edits with an algorithm? So this is, this is actually something that's happening on English Wikipedia right now. As far as I know, this is the only wiki that has a system that does this. It's called Clubot NG. Um, and so uh, only for those edits that it's extremely confident about, it will automatically revert. Um, and they claim a very low false positive rate. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of their analysis there. Um, but, but anyway, they're really only targeting the egregious edits. Like really, you have to, you have to put a lot of racial slurs in. Otherwise, uh, otherwise Clubot's gonna mostly ignore you. And then it goes to a different set of tools that are these uh, more, more on the human computation side of things where like the tool does most of the work of showing you a diff and you just have to click good or bad and it takes care of the rest. Um, sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. Do you see giving feedback why? Um, and maybe I'll even add to that. Do you see community involvement in the definition of the features and the thresholds for things at some point? Yeah, so, so I mean, um, okay, so, so talking about like the features and being able to say why an edit was, was scored as likely to be vandalism, that's extremely difficult. Like these algorithms are generally black boxes. Like there's some hidden correlation that's happening inside of there that tells us something that's often surprising about an edit that might be damaging. Um, uh, surprisingly right or surprisingly wrong. Um, this, is, this is sort of an active field around these sort of algorithmic strategies to make them easier to, to describe. Um, but on the other side, so you asked about like community involvement in this sort of stuff. So this, this project actually, I, I was not paid to work on this for a year until like three months ago. And so this was like, this was my volunteer work. Um, and so most of the people who work with me, I was saying they're, they're volunteers too because we just sort of thought that this was important and so we started working on it. Um, and so, so like, it, it's hard to like wave my hand and say the community, but there's a lot of people who aren't paid to do this who work with me. Um, we, we are, most of us, you know, speak one at most two languages. And so to have the language breadth that we have, we have to get collaborators who work on those wikis, who are familiar with them, who will actually tell people what the service does. And so they don't just do that, they also give us feedback, they make suggestions, they help us, they help us figure out what the model is doing right and what it's doing wrong. And so I'd say that we have a relatively high community involvement. Um, of course, we can always, we can always do more. I was wondering how you moderate pages um, with controversial content uh, things that get edited really frequently. Do you have like gun control or um, pages? Yeah, so the, the question was about like dealing with vandalism around controversial content, right? Um, so, so one of the things that we, we do do, and this is, this is relatively a recent development, um, so we used to count the number of bad words that were added in an edit. And so like, let's say you're, art, you're editing the article about a curse word or about um, a sexual position or something like that, then these, these types of things, every single edit to that page will be flagged as potentially damaging. And so that's, that's problematic. And so I kind of waved my hand earlier about the, at this uh, prop delta sum thing. But that's, that's uh, a different way of thinking about the number of, uh, like how you actually change the content in the edit. So let's say that you're editing the, the article about a curse word. If you add another instance of that particular curse word to the page, you'll get a really low score for this prop delta sum because it's taking into account how often that word already happened in the page. Um, but if you add a different curse word to that page about uh, this curse word, um, I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to offend anybody by using examples, but I think you understand what I mean. Um, then you'll actually get a very high score. So if it didn't already exist somewhere in the page, then it's going to say, "Hey, this is a bad word and it's unusual. I didn't expect to see it here." As opposed to, "It's a bad word, but I see that happen a bunch, so it's not a big deal." Um, and that gave us a substantial boost in fitness, and I think that that's exactly where we're getting it around uh, pages that will tend to have content that shows up as as potentially bad. Um, I, I think that uh, like pushing into um, like so so say we were going to to work on the, uh, catching damage in the article the um, Israeli-Palestine conflict um, that will be much more tricky 
I think even catching damage there is, is tricky, and so we're probably not getting a lot of false positives there yet. Hi, this is a question for Mariel. Um, you mentioned jQuery, and I was wondering if the OUI used any other libraries or frameworks and kind of why and what makes that suitable, those ones suitable for what you guys are working on. So yeah, uh, OUI uses jQuery. Um, OJS has actually two versions, one with and one without. Um, you have to remember that when we started this, this was 2011, there was not like a lot of the libraries that now are kind of like, why aren't you using that, that new? Um, I think jQuery, you know, has a, has a lot of power in terms of, you know, kind of uh, um, communicating with the DOM. Um, it has a lot of things that it, it is missing, which is why we wanted to build something on top of it, but we're definitely using it um, as much as we can and, you know, to, to simplify our work. Uh, within the library. It definitely depends on jQuery UI, and on jQuery, not on jQuery UI, two different things. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I was wondering if there was anything else as well that you guys are, are using or, uh, and why or why not? I don't I think so anymore. I know that we used to have things that uh, dealt with some language stuff, uh, but not anymore. Like, um, we tend to do a lot of those ourselves, especially since a lot of the other stuff tend to not give us, you know, the exact thing we need. So um, we had something with Unicode, if I remember correctly. It was an external library that we ended up replacing with our own thing. Um, I don't think nowadays we use anything other than jQuery externally. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so the question is, okay, so the question is, I kept saying we can't trust the DOM, so what is the alternative? The alternative is to use um, a data structure that keeps the data for you. I don't trust the DOM for the data itself. So I, obviously I need to you know, build stuff on there, so I trust it in that level. But in order to give me the data that gives me the state of my you know, interface or my product, I don't want to trust that. So I use other objects that are not part of the interface. Some either, you know, data objects like I showed before, or a container that just, that's where the data is stored. So the UI will follow, either listen to events, or query the data object directly uh, in order to get information, and not query the DOM. That, that's right. The data, the data objects are not part of the DOM. That's correct. Uh, this is a question for Aaron. Uh, how do you validate and coordinate uh, language-specific features? Uh, so, so most of our language-specific features are um, uh, two lists, bad words and informals. Um, we also have lists of um, stop words which are usually words that don't carry meaning, like articles, uh, prepositions, that sort of stuff. Um, just trying to think now. Oh, we, we, we also have uh, stemmers, uh, which usually come from the Natural Language Toolkit Library for Python. Um, and, but only some languages have those. And so uh, if the language doesn't have uh, a stemmer, then we just don't use features that, that have anything to do with stemming. Um, and so using these, uh, the features that we can get from the language, then we'll, uh, sorry, using these, these um, data structures that we can get from a language, we'll then use the features that uh, derive from them. Um, we also have a few features that are um, not exactly language specific, but they'll be wiki specific. So for example, uh, we don't just have like, uh, is this edit damaging as our models? We also have like, what sort of quality level is this article? And one of the things that's really useful in figuring out how high of quality of an article is, is how its references are formatted. Wikipedians use templates to format references. Um, and so you need somebody who's local to that wiki, who knows what templates, which are probably not going to be in English, if it's not English Wikipedia, um, are actually used for this sort of stuff. And so we'll, we'll have uh, local collaborators from that wiki help us understand 
uh, uh, what those templates look like, and then we'll turn the presence of those templates, the count of them that appear, and that sort of stuff into features. Um, and so we, we sort of have a hierarchical structure for how, how we generate features. So we have language independent features that are actually, uh, that's actually another level of the hierarchy because there's wiki text and then there's wiki base, which is our structured wiki data, uh, wiki stuff. Then we have uh, language specific features and then finally the wiki specific features because there's, there's English Wikipedia, English Wiktionary, Wikidata has a lot of English in it. Commons has a lot of English in it. And so, so like, you know, it gets specific at that level too. And that seems to be working out pretty well for us. It, it makes it easy to uh, add new wikis, especially new wikis that already draw from language assets that we have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so why use Python instead of, of Lua? Lua, as an example, is, is uh, a, um, a language that we have implemented on top of MediaWiki for building these things called modules. Um, and so uh, Python is really, uh, it, it, it's a nice environment to do data science in. And that's, that's really what brought me to it. So like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a, um, a computer scientist that does behavioral science work that just happened to realize that building machine learning models were important. Um, and luckily, uh, I had been doing my, my work in Python up to the point that I realized that I needed to build machine learning models. And Python has a really, really nice library for building machine learning models um, uh, called sklearn. And so, so this was a nice opportunity to be able to draw from a lot of work that people had already done building libraries that, that have these machine learning models available. Like really, uh, the, the rev scoring library that I was demonstrating here, in, in many cases, is really just a thin wrapper around models that are already made available through this sklearn library. Um, so so uh, as far as I know, there's nothing, nothing like that in Lua. Um, but, but really, like I think an important part of your question like, why not Lua? Why not make this inside of MediaWiki? And I think that that's a really, really good question. I think that it's really important that the technologies that we develop uh, are, are under the power and control of the, the people who are working in the, the social space that the algorithms are affecting. And, uh, you know, like, I don't have, actually have a good answer to that question, but I, I agree with you that it's important. It would be great if Wikipedians who are working on Wikipedia can directly affect the algorithms that are part of this machine learning model. Uh, right now, they'd have to learn Python. You know, maybe 20 years from now, if we do good planning, then they'll do it in the same language that they use on the wiki. Any other questions? All right, yeah, thank you so much. Um, looks like, are we, we have a little bit of a mixer after this, or? Okay, yeah, so we'll, this will end the Q&A section, and uh, feel free to hang out and ask a couple more questions. Thank you. Thank you.